A flooded home or business is never easy to deal with. The memories that are lost that you cannot replace. An aqua dam can be another tool in your arsenal to protect your home or business from the hurricane storm surge or the king tides. Look us up online at aquadam.net or give Aquadam a call at 707-764-2119. We can help. Uh, consider advertising on the Opperman Report. Uh, we have excellent advertising rates for you. Uh, the advertising rates are very affordable. Uh, once your ad goes up and we play the show on the podcast and on the YouTube channel, uh, those ads stay up there forever. And then we play repeats every single night of classic Opperman Report shows. And your new ads will be inserted into those repeats that play every single night. So uh, the, the, the saturation is incredible and the rates are very affordable. Contact me at oppermanreport at gmail.com. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMD Law. Available 24 hours, 7 days a week. Just log into kmdlaw.com. Or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be, because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Contact KMDLaw. EmailRevealer.com. Go to EmailRevealer.com. We handle adoption investigations, infidelity investigations, email tracing, locate or identify somebody from as little as an anonymous email address, someone owe your money, back child support. We can find that deadbeat and even assist you in obtaining a judgment and recover that judgment for you. EmailRevealer.com. Digital forensics, computer forensics, cell phone forensics, recover deleted text messages, create a report that you can use in court. Email revealer.com 800-572-9762. Hey guys, if you like the show and you want to show your support, uh, check out the Opperman Report Patreon. We have all the shows that you hear Monday through Friday on AMFM radio, but we cut out the ads. So you can hear that content ad free. The Opperman Report Patreon, you should stop there once a day and check out what's going on over there. That's Opperman Report Patreon. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, no, here's Investigator. <laughs> I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman. By the way, pretty soon I'm going to be your host, Private Investigator Captain Ed Opperman. Opperman. Ed Opperman. I uh, had a chance this week, uh, some friend of mine were in town and they chartered a uh, ship, a little boat, a charter ship, charter boat. And the captain of the boat, let me drive the boat around there. And uh, we were talking about this. He says, you know, I, I should get my captain's license, he tells me. So it's not that much. Uh, he's offered to teach me, you know, on his charter. So he'll take me out there for free and teach me. And then I'll get my captain's license. Uh, so you take a class, you know, with the, from the Coast Guard. And, uh, and that's about it. And they give you a test. And you're, and you're a captain. Captain. Captain Courageous Ed Opperman. That'll be me. Just be called Captain, I'll be happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll just be happy. Just call me, Captain. I'll never go out on a boat again my whole life. Welcome to the show. If you like our show, check out our Patreon, Opperman Report Patreon. A lot of great content there. Um, stuff you won't find anywhere else. And stuff you'll find weeks and weeks and months, if not years before, you'll find it anywhere else uh, in the news or the internet or YouTube or a po podcast. Or anywhere, man. It's just amazing how much stuff I'm, I'm uh, I talk about then shortly after. And we're, tonight we'll be playing a show about uh, Mike Lindell and his computer contest. He had our guest won the contest. Uh, uh, and um, next day, Mike Lindell is declaring, oh, I'm broke. I got to fire my lawyer. You know, so we just uh, Jake and Jelly, the, the QAnon shaman. Uh, we did a show with him about two months ago, and he says he still supports Trump. And then two months later, uh, TMZ, and that's, uh, for headline news, uh, QAnon says he still uh, supports Trump. 
So this could be, we're going to be examining today, we're going to be uh, analyzing the situation. Is the Opperman Report a time travel portal? We're going to be looking into that and uh, discovering uh, if we are or if we are not. Like the Twilight Zone. I just love that show. Archives are always free. Go to Spreaker.com. Uh, if you listen to the show on another platform like YouTube or Apple Plays or iHeart, please instead go to Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Um, I get 10% more from the advertisers if you listen on Spreaker. And so it would be just such a huge help if you could share the Spreaker link or if you could listen on Spreaker instead of, especially YouTube. I get paid nothing on YouTube. It's a sin. All the, the work they've stolen from me over the years and, and deleted my content and censored me and all the trouble. And, and you go there and, and you're on YouTube, man. It just breaks my heart. Uh, I see a comment from somebody on YouTube. I just, I just want to spit. I just want to spit on you <laughs> with hatred and disgust. But that's how I feel about all my audience. I don't feel uh, 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 signaled out there. Uh, so let's see. Uh, that's all our stuff there. I want to thank the folks over at the Dali Museum, the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, I used to be a member down there. I used to have a membership, but my membership has elapsed. Uh, but they're so kind to me um, because of the radio show. You know, when I ask, it says, hey, you know, you got an event there that's sold out. Hey, can I come down? Can I get a press pass? They had a poetry reading last night, and we had trouble getting tickets and admission you know but they, they just said oh don't worry come on down bring a guest uh, i met the poets uh, helen uh, helen wallace uh, the wonderful woman uh another fellow peter mankey and uh bob jones this uh another poet a local saint petersburg poet so once again thank you so much last time i went there too I, they had sold out their tickets and i says hey you know can i come down i got the radio show i'll plug it on the show and they, they ushered me into a special area in the seating. They introduced me to the uh, the speaker. Just just so kind to me there. Uh, and it's a beautiful facility with all of the Salvador Dali art. And there's a little film on surrealism that's for free in the in the lobby. You know, there's a great gift shop. Not like a little a gift shop museum, a little tacky gift shop. This is a real uh, a beautiful like boutique. You know, with the Dali uh, artwork and. And books and films and, you know, and then the tchotchkes, like the mugs and stuff like that and T-shirts, but just all beautiful artwork there. There's a little sections, too, where they have uh, local artists uh, exhibits in these rooms to, off to the side. You know, they'll have like high school. What They had one there one time was a kids like, like in the third grade doing surrealist art. Just a beautiful, beautiful facility there. They have yoga. Uh, they're so kind to me over there. Just thank you so much. Salvador Dali Museum. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'll be getting another membership there soon, I promise you. Um, oh, boy, there's so much. Oh, God, I had such a week. I have had such a brutal week this week. You have no idea. I um, A little job I had, right? Get contacted. Hey, I got served with a complaint and a summons. Uh 18 days ago, I have to respond in two days. It's a divorce custody case. And uh, the clients are people I've known for a long time. And we should have done this two years. I, I was saying we, we need to be proactive and file these, our own complaint in custody two years ago. I uh, had a great case lined up for them. But, you know, that happens. People procrastinate. You know, you have issues and you, know, you become paralyzed with uh, emotional paralysis when you're dealing with these kind of life events. Especially, you know, when your children are involved and stuff like that. It's just a huge situation, uh, emotionally draining. Um, but they contacted me two days ago and said, okay, we were served 18 days ago. We have 21 days to respond. I says, listen, don't worry about it. I'm familiar with your case. Uh, get me the complaint. And then they were coming back from the courthouse, okay? They had met with some free legal, you know, advice down there. And I said, listen, don't worry about that. I don't want to see a photograph, an iPhone picture of the complaint, okay? I want you to stop at Kenko's on the way home, scan the complaint and the motion, and send it to me so I can read it, print it out, highlight it. And then I'm going to, uh, uh, don't worry, I'll stay up all night, 
I'll get it done for you in two days. Um, I know just the exhibits we need. Okay, so I, I went and started picking, you know, I'd go on, online to different um, applications and chat rooms and stuff like that where I knew the uh, the, the text messages were that we wanted. <sighs> And I was ready and committed to work all night long, get this done for them. And uh, yesterday morning, I got a message. Oh, they, they never, yeah, I'm waiting for them to pull the car over <laughs> and send me the complaint. You know, I said, oh, okay, well, send it to me when you get home. No, 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 it's a two hour drive home. Pull over now, get it to me now so I can start working on it now. I'm going to work all night for you. And I got a message the next morning. Oh, good news. Uh, we did it ourselves. We filed the response, and uh, we're all done. And you know, <laughs> just, <sighs> just unbelievable. You know, just unbelievable that uh, you know you keep me waiting. You know, uh, I agreed to work for you. You know, I, you know, I charge extra overnight and on weekends, even for phone calls and emails. You know, I charge extra, almost double. You know, and I wasn't going to do that in this case. And it's just, just outrageous, man, that people would, you know, you, you commit your time for them and they just blow you off and then screw themselves in court. Just heartbreaking uh, to see a situation like this, especially people you care about. And then on top of that, uh, one of the witnesses in this case, uh, her and her husband, I had to get in contact with them and say, hey, you know, get a hold of all these text messages and stuff like that. And they were sick. They just had a brand new baby, a brand new two month old baby, and they were sick and they couldn't even get to the uh, pharmacy to pick up the medicine and the formula and all that stuff like that. And they, the, the Uber Eats wouldn't deliver this stuff because uh, it was a you know uh, prescription medication. It's this huge, giant mess here with, with trying to help these people out. Uh, all this time and effort I put into it. And then, in the meantime, you know, I got these wackos. Uh, the, the lonely broken hearts club all these people i blocked uh, or it's like a man they in love with me man just like trolling me all over the place just insane uh but but in the long run though it's a good thing that uh, i didn't stay up all night working on this because i'd be totally exhausted today and I'm, ar- I'm already so exhausted and like all of us so incredibly emotionally drained by the events of this week Okay, Um, this whole uh, Israel-Gaza situation uh, that that, that is just traumatizing our nation. Just imagine what it's doing over there, the people that are suffering, this carpet bombing that's going on right now. And... um, the division it's causing here in our country uh, with people. I want to play something for you that's always meant a lot to me. It's the the poem "If" by Rudyard Kipling. I did a whole show about this once before, uh, but I'd like to play this for you now and then just have a little commentary on it. The Kipling poem. It's, it's one of my favorites since, since I was a, a, a boy at school. My father read it to me once. And I think it, 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 to me as a little boy, it summed up what a man should be. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about don't deal in lies or being hated don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor look too wise if you can dream and not make dreams your master if you can think and not make thoughts your aim If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Or watch the things you gave your life for broken. 
and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at the beginning and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are done and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, Hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 40 seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. You know, I've been so blessed in my life to have a, a great father. Um, who, who taught me great manners and uh, self-respect and dignity. And I, I do thank him for that. And when I first heard this poem, uh, if you can keep your head while all those about you are losing theirs. Um, when I, you know why I heard this the first time? In Mad Magazine. Um, in Mad Magazine, and it was a joke, and it says, if you could keep your head while all those about you are losing theirs, you will be the tallest one in the crowd. And I thought that was so funny. And I remember making that joke, because I used to think when I was a kid, I was a comedian. You know, I used to watch Maury Amsterdam on Dick Van Dyke's show and watch these stand-up comedians, and I used to think I was a jokester, you know. And I remember telling the joke to my father, and he goes, oh, you know, that's from a, a wonderful poem and you should look it up because it's a great poem and it's something you should you should know and you should learn. And then I made the same joke. I think it was my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Smith. And um, I said the same joke to him, too. And he told me the same thing. He says, I want you to look up this poem. I want you to go down to the library and look up this poem. And I went down to the school library and I, I got it at our school library and I read the poem. And, and, you know, of course, it didn't mean that much to me at the time. But later on in life, especially that first line, that if you can keep your head about you when all those around you are losing theirs, if you can stay calm while everyone else is panicking, you immediately have the upper hand. You have the, 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 you have the first step into taking the role of leadership in that group. And I use that my whole life, and I've been in certain yeah, my whole life. I've always been the you know the most aggressive guy in the whole, and I've used that. Says okay, okay, let me just when a, when chaos comes, when crisis comes, is when I'm the calmest, and I do that uh, purposefully. And I taught this to my daughter, and she does this, and I taught this to many other people who've worked for me, who've been in the, the arena with me. And I know that they've benefited from this in their life. That this is what, for one piece of advice I could give you is to, when there's chaos in the room, if you can stay calm, everyone will turn to you for leadership. Now, the same goes in a situation like this week where we are all being traumatized all at once, okay? Uh, we're watching this situation, hysteria hysteria and, and a bloodlust of revenge unlike I've seen I think in my lifetime such a hysteria um, and people uh, I would caution people to, to, to sit patiently and not jump into this debate and not consume yourself or overwhelm yourself with all this 
uh, information coming at us over the TV and the news. Okay. I even think, well, first of all, I, I, I'm very suspicious of a lot of this video we see coming. You know, in, in times of war, the first casualty is the truth. And this nowadays, especially in 2023, 2024 coming up, that the, the, the ability to, to create wartime propaganda footage is greater than ever before. Why are we seeing all this wartime footage in real time, you know, cell phone footage that we don't see in Ukraine or we don't see in other conflicts? We see it here overwhelming all this video. And then we, we're hearing these hysterical unsubstantiated stories of beheadings and little old ladies making matzo ball soup or being kidnapped uh, just for no rhyme or reason. Where, uh, the, even a lot of this video we see of this uh, this rave, this uh, festival, it just seems so staged and bizarre and unreal. And the whole idea of uh, paratroopers or what were these parasailers, gliders coming in, you know, just like, like all of this is just so bizarre. And, and then we start hearing late. So Netanyahu had an advanced warning, you know, what, oh, I think even there's even a third path of now the conspiracy theorists are going to be, become, I, I tell, I caution everyone to calm down and be patient. Okay, and and let's reserve judgment on all this until the the dust has settled. And and unfortunately, we're we're seeing you know carpet bombing, and all of North Gaza is going to be flattened and uh, be depopulated, depopulated, and taken over by Israel. The, the map has changed as of now. Um, without huge substantial help from every arab nation and russia and china just there is no um this is not a fair fight um the where it's going now and for even more funds to be dumped into the, the lap of israel when you see these videos they have so many tanks and so many fighters they don't have the the population the people to fill all those and drive all those tanks at this point they just don't have it the training it takes, you know, when suddenly we're going to be loading them up with, with more munitions. It, it, it just it doesn't exist, okay? Um, and I think so much of what we're seeing is end-stage capitalism and, and um, a looting of the, 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 <sighs> looting of the, what do you call that? The, the money, <laughs> you know, what do you call it? The, uh, the, the reserves, the, you know, the Federal Reserve, the, the, the banking, you know, the looting of all the, Budget. I'm losing the word. But I, I would especially caution the people to, to really take a step back from all this. Uh, all of our shouting at each other and losing friendships, <laughs> which I'm so disgusted by some people. I, I can never be friends with them again. Um, it, it's also important to consider that the, the way people live over there in the Middle East and in these areas, it's not like we live here in New York, okay? You know, you can be bloodthirsty here in New York, but over there, it's it's, it's real, okay? I have a very close friend who was, um, she was part of, she was in the Olympics, okay? She was an Olympic athlete. And she would help Victoria train Victoria for basketball. And she was part of the protest movements here, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, the, uh, uh Standing Rock and all of, all the Bernie stuff, you know, part of a leftist uh, activism in Las Vegas, uh, to the point where um, the police were targeting her, you know, and trying to get her arrested and following her home and checking her for warrants and stuff like that. She had to leave the country. She went to live in Palestine for a while and then went to live in Israel, lived in Africa. And she tells me, she says, you know, Ed, man, in Palestine, uh, in this, these areas, you know, that uh, they're so racist against blacks that they're just racist against African Americans. Whereas Israel, they're not so bad. But there are places in Israel, you know, you have these evangelicals, you know, it's, oh, well, you know, if God blesses Israel, if you're good to Israel, God will be good, you know, all this stuff. And these evangelicals who go to Israel thinking that they're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, they, and you're taking your life in your hands, they'll spit on you over there. They'll knock your table over. They'll knock your uh, their street evangelism over. And there are places 
these um, uh, settlements where no one can tread. You know, you, you can't even go there, even with the locals, the local um, cab companies won't take you there. You know, there are places, man, that, that you just cannot go because the settlers and the people are just so barbaric. OK, to any kind of outsider, even, you know, of their own, they look just like them. OK. And a lot of that stuff never hits the news because you, know, you, you say the wrong thing. You're anti-Semitic. You're just, it's just you can't. You, you, everyone's got to walk on eggshells on these topics. It's just outrageous. I know a lot of people seem to think that I'm Jewish. I, I have no Jewish blood in me whatsoever. But, but my heritage, my name, Opperman, is German Lutheran. Uh, my mother was born in Cuba. My father is German. My and a grand my grandfather uh, my grandmother's side is uh, Irish from Ireland, uh, Catholic. Okay, well that whole side of the uh, both sides of the family were Catholic. Okay, and I became born again Christian, uh, Pentecostal, Protestant. Um, but I, uh, a lot of people will say, "Well, it's it's a Jew, it's a Zionist." You okay? I I when back when I it mattered back in the seventies. I'm sixty years old. Okay, so I'm, I have a history of these these uh, discussions. Um, going way back when they mattered. Okay, I was anti-Zionist. Okay, I didn't believe in any state of Israel or or a very limited state of Israel, and certainly not this hegemony that we see over there. Um, uh, but then over the years, you know, we have a situation now where you know there's. People, great grandkids have been born there. You know, their great grandfathers founded the joint. What do we all pack up and leave? They can't pack up and leave. Uh, but something has to be done to to stop this uh, this these open air prison uh, areas, um, and the, you know the checkpoints and the, and the 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 military. You know, fighting with kids and arresting kids, and you know. Uh, just a, a tragic situation over there that anybody can can see. Uh, so, but m- well, the thing is, though, it, the images we're hearing, beheadings and or debates over beheadings, um, none of this is going to do any of us any good. Okay, and so we all calm down, take a deep breath, and keep our heads. Okay, because this is a situation where when everyone else around you is losing their head, this is the time to stay calm. And I hope uh, I'm making sense to you, you know, and I know that the, the tickles some people when they hear me say, oh, I hope I'm making sense to you. I, well, I hope I'm making sense to you. Sometimes you, you in particular, because I know you don't understand what I'm talking about, Mr. Commentator. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Leaving me comments every freaking where in the world. Fair break, man. You know, there's some people just don't, you know, you can smack them in the head with a, with a you know, they can't get it. <sighs> is the Opperman Report a time travel portal? <laughs> okay. Is it? That's the question. I wonder sometimes, and I'm going to do this a little bit of out of order, um, because honestly, there there is one instance in my life where I wonder, uh, about time travel. You know, there's that whole thing about Donald Trump and Baron Trump, how there's that book from like the 1800s that's written about a little boy named Baron Trump from New York and its similarities to his father being president and this kind of stuff like that. And then the author wrote another book called The Last President. And there's all that stuff about Trump's uncle who uh, actually had access to Nicholas Tesla's uh, Nikolai Edwards. Ed, Ed. It's not Nicholas Tesla, it's Nikolai Tesla. Oh my God. The, the Tesla worshippers out there are some of the most obnoxious people on the planet. <laughs> okay, uh, but uh, Trump's uncle had access to the Tesla documents after his suspicious death and looting of all his uh, his uh, research. So, though there is some odd speculation out there, you know, of course, in the more fringe areas of our existence. It could Donald Trump be access to some type of time travel. Yeah, and you remember the uh the time travel movie Back to the Future where they had that guy Biff who became a Donald Trump type character because he had access to a an almanac from the future? Isn't that odd? You know? 
you know? So, and then the whole thing about the, I, I hate to get into all this because I, I, you know, listen, this is, I'm having fun with this. But the whole thing about how Trump coming down the escalator and it matched so much to almost to the T of the Simpsons episode where he's coming down the escalator. All these little things. But there was one event in my life. Uh, I was invited to go to the U.S. Open. The David Dinkins Stadium in New York City, the U.S. Open, which is a great experience if you ever have a chance to do that. It's not just a tennis game. You know, there's a you know, like a flea market type of situation or an outdoor, you know, crafts and you know uh wine tasting all kinds of you know wonderful foods out you know a little a little fair outside you know then you go inside for the u.s opens you know it's very interesting very steep the, you know the stadium is very steep you feel like if you had a couple of drinks you could fall down you know uh this particular time it was the day after princess diana had died in that crane the train plane car crash and we had great seats in fact, I went with a buddy of mine who uh, was one of my smuggling buddies. We used to smuggle together. And he had gotten caught early on before any of the other of us had. Before any, At least before I had. And that's really all that really mattered. Because <laughs> when they got me, or that's when everything, all that, uh, everything hit the fan. Um, but uh, when he got caught, you know, of course, I paid for his attorneys and stuff like that. And we worked on his case and made sure that you know he didn't have to do any jail time. But then we also I paid an extra ten thousand dollars at that time. This is around Princess Diana time. I paid an extra ten thousand dollars, which is a lot of money back for those days, man, for him to keep his stockbroker's license. So today, you know, he's a very successful, um, wealthy man. Uh, and at the time, you know, he was a very successful, wealthy man too, and had access to these box seats there at the U.S. Open. And who was sitting? Not even 20 feet away from us, but Mr. Donald Trump. I could throw a rock and hit him. Okay. His seats were a little bit better than ours, but not much. You know. And he was there with a couple of these blonde models. And I remember this one model she had. uh, She was like, you know, they were all standing, you know. And when he left, you know, right away she put her sunglasses on. She, you could tell she was like had a really bitchy attitude, you know. <laughs> she had all big smiles, you know, and uh, waving her baby blues and batting her eyelashes at Mr. Trump. Uh, but once he left, you know, she had her sunglasses on. She was, you know, bitching and moaning about every little thing. And but the thing is, man, is you know, remember that the, the the activity is taking place down on the tennis court, and I'm above Mr. Trump. Uh, but every time I would, I'm watching a game, you know, every time I'm moving my head around, I look by, my head passes by President Donald. He's staring daggers at me. Staring right at me. Out of this whole stadium. A lot of people there. It's unsettling. I didn't know the man. You know, I'd been to Trump uh, casinos and stuff like that. You know, I'd, I'd seen him in person, you know, stones throw away, but not that we, he would know who I am or I would, you know, never shook his hand in my life. But there was one incident prior to this where possibly, and this I always thought, well, this must be the reason why he's staring at me like this, giving me these dirty looks, is that um, uh, when the whole thing came out about Marla Maples, that uh, Trump was having an affair with Marla Maples when he was still married to Ivana Trump, um, and the tabloids found out about Marla Maples, it was all over the news that weekend, and when I went out with some friends of mine who were flight attendants, they said, you'll never believe who's staying at our flight attendant apartment in Manhattan. And I said, who? They go, Marla Maples. <laughs> and I says, what? She goes, yeah, yeah. She came in. She didn't even have luggage. She had two garbage bags that were her clothes in, and she's hiding out in our apartment because she's a friend of one of the girls there. And so I said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I says, hey, let's tap the phones. <laughs> this is before cell phones. Or that. I says, I can go in there and, and put a recorder on the phones and we'll sell it to the tabloids. We'll have all this kind of information to the tabloids. And they all got mad at me. Oh, how could you dare say that? Oh, the poor girl. She's there with her shopping bags. <laughs> She's on the run from the paparazzi. And here you want to betray her and sell her to the paparazzi. I said, all right, all right. I don't need the money anyway. Okay. I'm paying for the whole night out. <laughs> Okay, you forget it was paid for this night out. Okay. And, um, hey. 
But a few months after that, I remember, a few months after the Marla Maples incident, or maybe even a few weeks after, I was sitting with Bo Deedle, the private investigator, and um, I had mentioned about how my friends were with Marla Maples, and I made a joke about wanting to tape the phone calls and sell it to the tabloids. So I always assumed that it was Bo who ratted me out to Trump. And he ran to Trump and says, hey, you know, Mr. Trump, this guy, you know, he's talking about taping your girlfriend here. You know, I can keep an eye on him for you. And doing all I need is a 5,000 retain. I'm going to keep an eye on him for you, you know. And, and back in those days, too, it was very common for a guy as rich as Trump to get a hold of your, your phone records every month. You know, they would buy it every month, every month, every month. So I, I always uh, thought, well, maybe that's what happened. But no, what if there is, what if Trump does have access to a time travel machine or a book or whatever? And he knew they're sitting there at the U.S. Open that one day I'd be, you know, involved with the, the, the Epstein, the Trump Epstein lawsuit that one day, you know, like right now I got two former clients sitting there that testified against them there in, uh, in New York City, the Marla, the uh, Stormy Daniels case. You know, that he'd know that I was, you know, all these people involved with the Stormy Daniels thing, that he'd know that I'd be doing all this reporting on him. I'm going to be doing some talking about him in a little while here about the, his lying about the size of his apartment. <laughs> okay. By the way, if you haven't been watching the news this week, because I've been talking about the, the, the value of Mar-a-Lago the past couple of weeks, the past two weeks in a row. But what's now with all this chaos going on there in the news, you, you don't know that uh, the whole situation with him lying about the size of his apartment in, in Trump Tower is how outrageous that is. Trump was trying to claim it was over 10,000. No, no, no. Yeah, Trump is saying, originally said it was over 10,000 feet, square feet. But then he valued it at being 30,000 square feet. Okay. And basically he's saying because he has three floors, then each floor is 10, because, you know, you know, there's high ceilings, you know, and they're even trying to include part of the roof. But even with the 10,000 square foot estimation, did you know that they're including the hallways and where the elevators are? Okay, <laughs> they're including that space as part of Trump's living space that he wants to uh, evaluate his square footage of his apartment. So it's not even 10,000. And what came out this week, too, by the way, with all this chaos, you haven't seen it either, but um, Alan Weisselberg, uh, the CFO, it, it, it's looking like he may be facing perjury charges for his testimony this week, okay? Because uh, he was trying to say that he was never so interested in the size of Trump Tower. He was never really involved in it. Uh, and now all these emails came out and a whole article in Forbes magazine. It's amazing how Trump was able to lie to Forbes magazine and then they list him as one of the richest men in the world with this valuation of what his net worth is and then use that public perception in order to raise money and fool the public into investing with him. Just incredible how, because you or I could never lie about the, the square footage of our apartment or our home because there's recorded documents that, that would be supersede what we lie about and put down on papers. But these guys, man, they're just allowed to do it. And you wonder how, you know, you wonder how they get away with this kind of stuff. But that's just one example of uh, the Opperman Report being a time travel portal. Uh, I mentioned uh, in the end, uh, the pre-up to the show here, uh, Jake and Jelly, the QAnon shaman, this was on my show two months ago, right? And uh, talking about how he still supports Trump. And then you see the other day, TMZ has a front page story about QAnon Shaman announces he still supports Trump in an exclusive interview. Of course, they don't mention me, right? Of course not. Uh, by the way, too, that reminds me, too. Uh, uh, the, the, what else? The, the Steve Bannon porn and meth house, right? Who told you about that first, okay? Uh, Ed Opperman and the Opperman Report told you about that first. And time Was that time travel? Did I? How did I know in advance? Okay, well, I found the guy who was the uh, tenant in the home there. Uh, you know, exclusively interviewed him. Uh, he had done interviews, I think it was with PBS or Discovery Channel, something like that. And like, did like 10 hours sat down with them, but they never used it because they were afraid of the story. Uh, funny, I, you know, I tell you, I just thought of this a second ago. It's not even in my notes. Um, but when, because Morning Joe mentioned 
my reporting, okay, weeks after I, I did the show. Okay, and I know they got it from my show, first of all, because I figured out who from the Morning Joe show was subscribed to my, my membership at that, at that time. I don't know if they're part of my Patreon now, but at the time they were in the member section. We saw the name. <laughs> so we know who it is. Okay. Um, but what happened was um, I used to go to this clinic in Las Vegas to get my prescription for testosterone, to shoot myself up with testosterone. And uh, I couldn't afford to go to a real doctor. And I was friends with the head of the clinic, uh, Dr. Shin. In fact, I even had him as a guest on our show a couple of times, helping to raise money for this Hope Medical Clinic that was part of my church, uh, part of their uh, city impact center that they had this free clinic for people to go to. Now, the only issue was, though, is that at this clinic, it was run by a bunch of interns, young medical student interns, okay? Or maybe they were very recent graduates. And there was like only one real doctor there. So you would go in and you'd talk to the internist, okay? And they would take down your thing. So these internists, you know, they're brand new doctors. In fact, I would even catch them standing around talking about video games. And I would like snarl at these stupid kids. <laughs> you know, we would disgust, you know, at these kids. Um, but uh, what do you call it? So they, they, these kids, you know, you tell them what you want, you know, but they would try and find, you know, they were trying to discover a new disease or whatever, you know. So I'm talking to one of these kids one day. And I go, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a private investigator. Yeah, you know, I got to talk show on the radio. Uh, and he goes, oh, boy, that that must be very interesting. I says, yeah, you know what, man, it is. But I'm a little pissed off because, you know, just, just this morning, morning Joe was talking about one of my, my stories. And I didn't get any credit for it. And he goes, oh, really? And I'm watching him write it down. He goes, oh, I'm morning Joe was talking about you. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, um, you know, what else? You know, how are you feeling with this? You know, how's the medicine working out? Okay, great. Okay, everything good. Okay. So then, you know, you go, the doctor comes in. And he goes, um, uh, so uh, I see here uh, you like to watch TV. Yeah. <laughs> I go, yeah. Yeah, right. And you know, I said I really don't like to watch TV that much because I don't like to get addicted to a new, you know, series like Breaking Bad or, you know, maybe it was Mad Men at the time. And I don't like to get caught up on these mysteries and then I you know, get addicted to it and I got to watch it. You know, I, so I'll, I'll keep the news on in the background. You know, I don't like to get too caught up in TV shows that I got to watch it every week. He goes, oh, so I'd like to watch the news then. Oh, that's very interesting. So, and then when, when you watch the news, sometimes you hear them talking about you. <laughs> you, hear them, or you, you hear them talking about you on the news. And I said, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, you know, like, you know, I was just telling you, your kid over there, you know, about the, the Steve Bannon porn and meth house, you know, they were cooking porn, you know, meth, and uh, his wife was a porn star, you know, and it was all, you know, this stuff, you know. And he goes, oh. So he thought that I was saying, the first doctor thought that I was saying that I was hearing audible voices coming from the TV set that were, that were talking to me. <laughs> Not that I was actually involved in a story that was being reported on the news, which I, you know, I'm, I'm in one right now. Uh, there's this whole thing going on. But yeah, how, about, how about the whole Jim Jordan thing, by the way, too? Who told you about Jim Jordan first? Right. And, and uh, the whole um, OSU scandal and like, stuff like that. You know, I got another guest. I just contacted him tonight. I never actually interviewed him. I think he's pissed off at me, too, because he sent me a client one time. and I never got around to getting back to him. Um, but uh, he used to tell me he told me that Jim Jordan was the king of the sauna because Jim Jordan was a big shot because he was an Olympic wrestling champion. OK. And. They used to have like a, a ceremony where, where who was the king of the sauna and all the younger uh, wrestlers down they used to hang around and because and, uh, Jim Jordan was like an assistant wrestling coach and they would idolize Jim Jordan. But he's, he's told me that one of the things that Jim Jordan used to do was is they would take a tongue depressor and they would scrape it down the back of Jim. The, his uh, student wrestlers would take the tongue depressor and scrape it, the sweat off his back and off his shoulders and off his armpits and his chest. Like they, like they were worshiping his body, okay? Now, he's never said that on the air. He told me this off the air, so there's no recording of it. Still. I'm trying to get him to come on and talk about it. But who told you about Jim Jordan before? Who told you about Jeffrey Epstein before me? Like, come on, who told you about Jeffrey Epstein before me? Talking about Jeffrey Epstein in 2013. 
You know, and what they weren't allowed to talk about that until Julie K. Brown came out and started talking about it, you know, years and years later. And even then, it really didn't come out until uh, the arrest and the death and all that kind of stuff there. Um, and that's how I got hired in that lawsuit is because when you went to, first of all, when you Googled Ed Opperman, you went to Google Images, you'd see a picture of Jeffrey Epstein would come up. And on YouTube and stuff like that, you know, that was the only guy talking about Epstein back in those days. Um, Sarah Palin, you know, when I did the Sarah Palin investigation, who knew about, even I didn't know, about the Russian influence in the Sarah Palin campaign. Didn't find out two years later that uh, John McCain was getting money and funding from this Russian oligarchs, you know. Uh, we had no idea at the time, you know. Uh, but who was talking about Sarah Palin first? Hunter Biden laptop. Who knew about that That whole story about the, 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 the different laptops? Everyone was talking about that crazy story about the John Mark Isaacs, you know, with the, the computer repair guy, the blonde, the blind computer repair guy. And everybody was repeating that story for years, man, uh, until I started talking about the whole Keith Ablo thing and the second laptops. And now we know all the stories about the counterfeit laptops coming from Russia. Um, Kevin Spacey. Who did a show about Kevin Spacey, man, before anybody knew about Kevin Spacey? His own brother didn't know that he was on the Epstein plane. You know, I think it's time travel. I think that Ed Opperman is is a time travel portal. That's the only logical explanation to all of this. Michael Jackson. Who I know about Michael Jackson before anybody. I knew about him back in 93 before Jordy Chandler. Uh Stormy Daniels stuff, man. Who knew about that? <laughs> he was up to his neck of that. Uh, maybe it's not a portal. It could be. <laughs> it could be a portal. You never know. Let's see what's going on here. Let me tell you what we're doing on time. I'm so tired, you have no idea. <sighs> The only thing left, yeah, it looks like like uh, I have some notes here about um, I don't even know what some of these notes say. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm talking about in some of these notes. Okay, and they make no sense. Okay, um, but it does look like Alan Weisselberg might be facing the perjury charges. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that for you. Coming up after this will be, first, we're going to be doing a story about Mike Lindell again, you know, time travel. Although I don't think we'll be touching on time travel in the show. Then the Young Jerks, our fellow there from the Young Jerks. Now, that show's been up in our member section for quite some time. Uh, he's a marijuana expert uh, about the marijuana his show. He has a podcast, and most of it is, Mike Crawford is his name. And... um we talk about cannabis, politics, and stuff like that. And then also, too, he's involved with this uh, true crime case that he's all excited about. Um, over the weekend, too, I'm probably going to play the May Pang show because it's a 20-minute show. It's in the Patreon. Uh, if you can help us out by supporting the Patreon this month, it would be a huge, huge help to me. Um, this month I am so behind on bills. I don't know what I'm going to do. They're actually going to put a lien against my condo. Uh, they had done this, um, what do you call it? Uh, assessment, you know, for, to build, to replace some of the roofs around here. And they were sending me this bill every month, but I have it on automatic payment. So I didn't know. Uh, and, uh, now they sent me a letter saying, Hey, you got to come up with 750 bucks. Otherwise we're going to put a, a lien on the uh, condo. And then also, too, my progressive insurance is doing a job on me. Uh, remember that whole situation where I was paying insurance on two cars and then uh, I paid the wrong one and then my insurance lapsed and then they never c contacted DMV to say that it was paid off. So they seized my driver's license in Arizona and I almost wound up in one of those kids in cages <laughs> over there in Arizona at the airport. I was able to tuck my way out of that. But now they, they want like $2,500 from me. I don't, I don't have that money. You know, they're handy to give them that. Uh, so that's another thing there. And then that freaking Cox cable. When I left Nevada, 
the day I packed up and moved, packed up my trailer and drove cross country from Nevada to Florida four years ago, four and a half, five years ago. Um, the last thing I did was I drove over to cable company. I dropped off the cable boxes. I had to sit there and wait online for like 45, 50 minutes waiting to drop off this stupid cable box. Left, you know, I got a late start. I was driving in the dark with no taillights on. And um, get, a year later, I get sent to collections. Cox Cable claims I never returned the box. We fought them. They found the box. They did an investigation and found the box. They sent me a letter. Oh, we're so sorry. We found the box. They took it off of collections. It went a year later. They put it back on collections. Okay, we got it taken off again. And now we, three years later, I'm back in collections again with the same $375 for this stupid cable box that was that they sent me a letter and said they found so I, I often wonder, you know, how much of this stuff that um, I'm constantly dealing with isn't uh, uh, systemic, uh, systemic harassment trying to keep me from doing my work, you know, because I do have this NSA employee who's stalking me like crazy. That I can document that. We, by the way, there's a whole big thing coming up. Uh, I better not talk about it. <laughs> I got a couple of big things coming up. But uh, one thing's coming up in the news. Uh, my involvement is kind of over, but uh, I'll be able to talk about my involvement when when I was involved. Uh, that'll be coming out soon. I'm a regular. I am a regular Doctor Who. You're right. Who? <laughs> what Doctor? Doctor Who? I, you know, I actually never watched Doctor Who, but I do think I'm a time traveler. I'm starting to think for sure. Um. Taping tomorrow, okay, uh, huge guest tomorrow I'm going to be taping with. And then also taping with a friend of mine who, um, she's uh, I know her through the show, she's a listener. And um, she used to be a bad drug addict uh, just a few years ago. And she did some little time in jail and got off the drugs and had this great repentance, born again experience. And she's a very faithful Christian now. She's married, uh, totally clean and sober, and has this adorable little boy, little brand new boy. He's like three years old now. Um, she's been clean and sober three or four years. But the problem is, is that she's got these insane fines and DMV fines. So she can't even like drive to work. She has to get rides to work. She can't get her driver's license because of the freaking uh, these fines that they give you. Uh, pretty much to keep people under the thumb of the probation and parole system. And she's got to come up with 7000 bucks just to break even and get her license and stuff like that. So she's got this GoFundMe. Her name is Adriana Frizzle, F-R-I-Z-Z-E-L-L. And you go, if you go to GoFundMe and you look up From Addict to a Future, I'll have the link in the, the, the description of this show here. It's on my Facebook I think I put it up on um, Twitter. Uh, but part of the problem is I got these lunatics on Twitter, man. Just they, I, you know, I, I blocked a bunch of people and uh, former guests too. And they've become just so heartbroken that I, they don't have my attention anymore that they've just become obsessed with me. It's just, it's the saddest thing. Grown men, grown men, just obsessed with me. I, I can show you some of their emails I, I love you please unblock me oh I don't, don't do anything the saddest most pathetic thing you've ever seen in your life and so it, I have to be very careful what I post because otherwise they just become they'll like they'll stalk this poor young girl they'll be a young mother but if you go on uh, uh, <clears throat> GoFundMe uh, from addict to a future it's Adriana A-D-R-I-A-N-N-A Frizzell F-R-I-Z-Z-E-L-L and her beautiful son named Jace Marcellus, a picture of him too. Oh, what a gorgeous kid. You got to check this out. And she's trying to raise about 5000 uh, So to, to get her back on her feet, she's married now. She's got a great husband. He's got a great job. Uh, but, you know, they're struggling, man. They got like two or three jobs each. And what happens too is um, what, sometimes she'll get a job. And then after the criminal background check comes back, she gets fired from the job. But she's uh, listening to the show. And that's how we met. We've become friends. Actually, we met because some of the, uh, these people were stalking her, too, uh, just for being a listener, just being a, a Facebook friend of mine and being an Instagram friend that they singled her out and started uh, stalking her. Just These people are just insane. It's just so crazy. I'm a regular Doctor Who. 
<laughs> okay, we're doing our time here. Um, great stuff. We had Matt Sergio come back, and we did a two part show with him about some great stuff, man. The Tavistock type stuff going on over there in England. And then John Hankey, who's done all those uh, documentary films about the uh, RFK assassination, and he's done one about the JFK assassination. Especially when he talks about Ted Shackley being arrested on the at the day of the assassination in, in uh, Dealey Plaza, and uh, George Bush being arrested there too. A lot of new information I never heard before. So we did a an, an episode with him. We're doing a second episode with him on Sunday. Got a huge legendary guest coming back on the show that I can't mention his name either because people will bother him. Um, and then tomorrow I have a guest returning too who's finally retired. And the first episode is, is, is historic. People talk about it all the time. And um, the second one now, he's he's retired. He's had to move to Europe, you know, because the issue's here in the country. And he's just written a book. Uh, so we'll have that. Once it's in the can, I'll be able to talk about it. You know, it's, it's so funny. Too. I was talking to uh, Matt Sergio about some different things, you know, yippies and stuff. And we were talking about Dave McGowan, you know, weird scenes inside the canyon. And I was remembering about how when I first had Dave on the show, he would say, well, who wants to listen to me? Who would want to hear me be interviewed? You know, because no one, yeah, they could read my my blog and my website. And he had that goofy website with the long title, you know, whale, blah, blah, blah. You know? <laughs> he couldn't even find it, you know. And he was, his attitude was like, who would even want to hear me talk? You know, who would want to hear me? And here he is now, such a legendary figure. It just uh, blows my mind when I, when I think back about it. I was listening to one of the, some old stuff where we were talking about him. But anyway, tonight's show is over. I would appreciate it if you could help me out and become a Patreon or, or just make a donation. We go to OppermanReport.com and check out the donate button. And help us out there because the, the, my expenses this month are just overwhelming, and it's really hard to keep up. Uh, there, there's such a glut of podcasters out there now, just uh, muddying up the waters uh, with all this kind of you know, uh, just news. Well, it's not even new, but it's pretty much regurgitating stuff I was talking about ten years ago, uh, but just diluting all this information. So it's really hard to make a living in this business now when there's just so much people just diluting all the all the waters out there, you know. Uh, so if you could help us out there with a donation or a um, uh, what's that thing called? A Patreon. Sign up to our Patreon. Always putting up new content there. Plus, we put up a lot of old stuff that people have never seen before. Uh, new content goes up every single day, though. You can't miss it. All right, guys, coming up to this will be the Mike Lindell story. So good night. And thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Everyone has gone away. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No one cares enough to stay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You must remember me, oh man. I know that you can if you try. So just open up your eyes, oh man. Look who's come to say goodbye.